Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm honored to be the one of the speakers at this uh, very high profile seminar. Um, but my understanding uh, as a first speaker, um, I probably would intend to set uh, this background for the main topics of Chinese investment into uh, Europe. Um, so my topic really is about um, uh, overview of Chinese economy, and it's important uh, for the Europe. Naturally, it's come up like two parts. Part one would be an overview of Chinese economy. So I would briefly tell you where's China from in terms of uh, economic power, and uh, what's the current position in the world, or uh, where China is heading to, then the current problems with Chinese uh, economy, right? Um, secondly, well, how China will be uh, become an important kind of a player in terms of uh, European economic development, uh, especially in the EU. So that come on the three aspects. One is trade, another is FDI, or China direct investment in Europe. Then the third one would be a sovereign debt crisis currently in the Euro zone. Okay, um, you know, Chinese people and the Irish people, we share this long history. We all claim we have 5,000 years history, right? I heard Irish people have good memory. So do Chinese. We have good memories. So we think about the world or situation in millennium, millenniums rather than decades. It's not like a young country like the United States, right? So let's turn the clock back 600 years. <coughs> that, that was in the Ming Dynasty, in the early like 15th centuries. So you would find this map it was strong uh, in the Emperor of Ming Le, so that is roughly 1418. So probably was the first accurate map uh, in the world, right? It's earlier than Colombo. Now we have a historical figure called, uh, figure called uh, Zheng He, who actually spent 30 years voyage across the world. Right? So that's the map. Okay, from this map, this map really is not that different from the current uh, uh, nowadays map from China. The key issue is Chinese people's perception of China is Zhongguo, that's the Chinese two characters. Zhong means middle, Guo means kingdom. So their perception of China, China is in the center of the world, right? So this is the, the map we from Ming Dynasty, okay, not trace back millennium, <coughs> millennium, only 600 or 500 years. Okay, let's look at let's trace back 500 years. Then you know where China is from in terms of economic power. Okay, from this uh, early uh, 19th centuries back for many hundred years or even millennium. You know, China was always the dominant economic power in the world. You know, up until like early 19th century, China produced one third of world product, right? What happened after mid of 19th century? So I guess every one of you, of you we are in the history, we fought against the same kind of enemy, like a, a opium war in China. Then after, if you look at here, before mid of 19th century, there are three big blocks. Red is China, amber is India, this is Western Europe. Then along with like uh, industrial revolution in the Western Europe, then China really left it behind. And uh, although in the history the British people tried to um, open the China store to do the trade, send the first trade mission to China, ignored by Chen Long Emperor altogether. Then they used the cannon ship, opened the Chinese store, and the Opium War started there. 
After the Opium War, really China was invaded many times by foreigners and uh, got into a civil war. Uh, that the whole almost the first, first half of the 19th century, um, 20th century, 19th century, sorry, um, China eventually had this uh, uh, Second World War, then following by the four year civil war between nationalists and, and the communists, but communists won the war. So the new China, or uh, communists, came into power in 1949. So if you look at, this is where 1949, when companies came into power. So the share of world GDP become shrink to like 5%, right? Then on the Moore's era, you know, followed former Soviet Union style of economic development. Then 30 years <coughs> up until end of 70s, there is no change. Almost keep like 5% of the share of GDP. Then start from end of 70s, launched by Deng Xiaoping, this economic reform and the open door policy. To so another, let's say 30 years, from 5% of world GDP up now, if according to uh, Madison's calculation, it's almost uh, 15, 16% of the share of the GDP. So this chart would tell us, okay, China now is really re regaining its uh, predominant position in terms of uh, world economic power, right? So, yeah. Something. Oh, yes. Okay. That was the story where China is from. Now, what's the position of China in the world economy, right? So there are four indicators would tell you where's China now. And uh, I would say, okay, I have some prospect for China's future development. Okay, let's quickly go through. As economists, you, know, you can't get away with figures, you know, the Taiwan. So although it's boring, but you have to. Okay, China now in, is number two in the world in terms of GDP, total GDP, <coughs> either in PPP term or in a nominal term. So uh, that was last year's figure from IMF. So next one, then the, the China is the second, ranked the second in the world. Is China a rich country? No, no. China is the first kind of poor superpower in the contemporary history. That means China is a rich country with full of poor people. So that is China's reality, right? So in terms of per capita GDP, China still left behind more than 90 countries in the world. Okay, international trade. China now, uh, like in 2010, became number one world exporter. But in terms of total volume, it's number two you know, just slightly after the United States. <coughs> I'm probably a stran stranger. Okay, another indicator, FDI. Oh, some strange uh, symbols, but anyway, forget it. Um, so this is in terms of billions of US dollars. In, the, in 2010, you know, uh, the first time the FDI influenced to China, uh, over like 100 billion US dollars, certainly mm -hmm. um, increased starting from the early 90s. Foreign reserves, that's some people blame China. You know, you save too much, right? So then you pump back to the United States and get the United States got into current trouble. So, uh, well, uh, my, my argument, you know, uh, my wife couldn't complain me save too much you know, for her to spend or overspend. Okay. So, but anyway, here uh, you're talking about uh, foreign reserve. Actually, by the end of the first quarter of this year, the foreign reserve now reached three trillion. That is a huge bomb there. 
know, if you got it wrong. Okay, um, what's China in the global crisis, right? Um, first of all, I have to say, China, before the, uh, this uh, uh, financial crisis actually uh, broke up, you know, China really was in a, not intentionally, in a very good position to deal with the financial crisis. For instance, uh, at that stage, China already got two trillion foreign reserve in hand, and 30 billion like uh, trade surplus, and the currency ran really is undervalued. So all those conditions is really good for China to deal with this uh, financial <coughs> crisis suddenly uh, uh, broke up. Then um, China's financial system, is especially banking system, the Chinese government uh, for a few years like to inject heavily into those uh, big fours and other, ba other banks, for instance, uh, like 100 billion US dollars actually insert, uh, injected into the uh, banking system <coughs> to get away those uh, bad loans in the early 2008, you know, before the lemon uh, um, collapse. And also like uh, big banks, for, for instance, the uh, agriculture bank got like uh, 50 billion US dollars injection. Uh, and uh, China Development Bank got like 30 billion. So all this like, uh, heavily capital injection into the financial system, make them in a very healthy kind of status, <coughs> right? Um, probably the, the most important thing is that the Chinese financial system is still kind of quite isolated from the world. For the one reason, because Chinese currency is not convertible. So that means uh, it's created a kind of uh, firewall you know, from uh, financial contagion, right? So that's the condition when uh, uh, this uh, financial crisis actually broke up. Then what China's response to this uh, crisis? Basically like uh, monetary policy and uh, also uh, fiscal policy. Uh, I think China reacted quickly and uh, effectively. So in terms of po uh, monetary policy, you know, from September of 2008 to December to uh, 2008, you know, uh, in interest rate, was cut like five times. You know, before then, six years, there's no change, right, in order to respond to this uh, financial crisis. Then, most influential package announced in November 2008, that is a, a stimulus package, right? So stimulus package, I think, is a, now we look back, it's very, very effective, although there's some side effects. But anyway, uh, it worked that actually uh, invest into uh, different sectors in the Chinese economy. I don't think I have time to go through details, but if you look at this <coughs> table, that shows you, okay, response from China to the financial crisis worked, and uh, the measures were effective. If you look at last four years in terms of GDP growth rate, you know, China probably is the only major economy left with uh, this impressive kind of uh, growth, you know, almost close to a kind of two double digit uh, growth. Um, this year, first half of 2011, GDP growth rate was like uh, by 9.6% against another uh, growth. Okay, that, that was the current position. Where's the Chi Chinese economy heading to? You know, economists always want to do some forecasts, you know, to impress people, to impress others, you know. Uh, this is a simple uh, ex exercise, you know. Really, we use only like uh, uh, 1980 to uh, 2005, those uh, kind of 25 years average growth for three countries, US, Japan, and China. So um, China uh, is a black line, um, US, is uh, kind of blue, then Japan is the pink one, right? That tells the story, okay, China will surpass the United States in the 2030 something, and uh, overtake Japan in the 2020. But if you look at the uh, GDP, like uh, the table previously, you know, China already you know, uh, surpassed Japan. 
last year. So that's almost eight years you know, uh, earlier than this uh, projection. This is a quite conservative one, use uh, extrapolating. But this one is the latest IMF forecast. That means uh, in terms of uh, purchasing power parity, that means uh, in, in real term, so in five years, China would overtake the United States, become the number one economy in terms of total GDP. Right? Um, World Bank, a recent publication said, okay, in terms of nominal, kind of use the market exchange rate, then uh, China should overtake the um, United States in 2030. So there are different versions of projections. But um, I'm the economist. You know, uh, that's only tell you the trend, the track. Um, really, the forecast is the art of telling people what will happen in the future, then explain why it didn't. So that's the forecast. Right? OK, uh, China now is facing challenges and problems with its, its economy. You know, China, how China can be sustainable over the next 30 years? You know, the past path is not reliable and useful anymore. So um, we have prob that structural problem, save too much, like uh, um, rely on the export, and also a fixed asset is uh, uh, really a, a as a two third of GDP growth, that, that's too much. Then the inflation currently, like over sixty, uh, over six percent, like the uh, first half of this year, the hot money get into China, property bubble, <coughs> the problem full of problems. Like if you look at, you know, whether you know, that now we, up till now we only look at the GDP. The GDP only tell you quantitative things, but not qualitative things, right? Like uh, social welfare, social cost of GDP growth, and that. a lot of problems in China. But I think a fundamental problem is the model. If Chinese model is right, then that shouldn't be a problem for China to keep, keep on rising. But my <coughs> understanding of the model here, OK, different from uh, Mao's era or even Deng Xiaoping's age, you know, it's more or less kind of dictatorship style, right? One man's decision. But now China got this uh, powerful um, standing committee of Politburo. Nine people, nobody actually above anybody else. It's almost collective decision you know, for, for the big uh, uh, issues and the policy. So this, well, if you like, you can get collective dictatorship or some, something like that. Okay, nine members at the head. This little man shows, okay, in the right hand is kind of still a planning element and a government intervention, right? It's a visible hand. You could see it. Everybody sometimes would blame. You know, China is not real market economy. But left hand in China downloaded really a Western market economy. Yes, all the essential efficiency, all the good things, you know, China learned and learned quickly from the Western. So this is an invisible hand. Then we have this uh, SOEs, the state-owned enterprises. Then we have this long. So the two legs and the two hands working together is better than one or half of the body. So that, that's the model. Whether it's model, okay, it's still debatable. Uh, debatable whether the model <laughs> would be a kind of become a consensus uh, uh, or Beijing consensus, but depending. Okay, uh, the importance to to for the EU, the EU. Okay, first of all, in trade. You know, China is now the second largest trading partner of EU, apart from uh, after the United States. And also, EU is the biggest kind of trading partner of China. Waste so much time. I don't think I have uh, details, but th this uh, chart will tell you <coughs> China and the EU are trading over one billion a day, you know, the total. This uh, figure would tell us. So FDI, okay, although uh, uh, the inward investment from China to, e to the EU is still 
very small, only kind of one fifth of the other, other direction, but it's increased very fast, three times if you compare with uh, 2010 and 2009. Well, 70 bond, I don't think I go too much. I, I would tell you that uh, starting from last year, so many senior officials from China visited Europe. That's, that's, that's what they are doing. They're trying. You know, tell you what, Spain now, uh, the China is now held like 12% of uh, Spanish kind of a government debt. Right? So uh, many uh, occasions in China actually are uh, um, invested in the bond demand. And uh, the reason why really uh, is not for trade because the uh, pig's economy altogether only count 3.5% of total export uh, of China. So really it's divers to diversify its uh, foreign reserves. At the moment it's uh, in a dangerous position China really hold like uh, one trillion US dollars of US uh, treasury bills. And with uh, American people just print more uh, green papers, you know, China is losing money every day. So that's not wise. So diversify its foreign reserves is the main purpose. Well, the Irish case, I'm, I don't think I, we can discuss this <coughs> after property session. My time is limited. But my, my uh, observation is uh, uh, there's not much activities going on between Ireland and China. It should be. The only uh, economy left is the Irish economy. Now China hasn't been uh, uh, closely, uh, actively involved. So you need uh, all these uh, activities you know, to set up a dialogue mechanism. OK, in conclusion, in conclusion. nowadays, you know, uh, this, because of China's rising in terms of economic power, now really uh, it's reflected by the coining of the new languages. For instance, uh, uh, Professor Neil uh, Ferguson from uh, Harvard uh, created this uh, word called uh, uh, Chi-America, right? The bilateral relations between America and China. Then uh, others created uh, uh, Chindia, uh, China and India. So I created one word, uh, uh, Chi-America, China and Europe, right? So the bilateral relations between Europe and China, I would conclude, you know, China and the EU uh, each become part of their solution of the other's challenges. So in other words, you know, China cannot continue her rise without the EU, and the EU's future development needs China. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>